It's inspiring. It's exhilarating. Mission control. We're looking at a red planet. Retro rockets are about to fire in. The dawn of a new space race of sorts. We can do this. Led not by competing nation states, but mega corporations. <laughs> Superstar CEOs and slick marketing campaigns. Science fiction and history are starting to converge. The goal, the human species walking. Are you ready for this? Are you? Perhaps living on another planet. Here we go. We know astronauts lose a lot of bone mass if they don't do things to mitigate against it. Same thing with muscle mass. Diane McGrath is in training for the most unlikely of missions. I used to be a long distance runner, you know, multiple marathons, innumerable half marathons, even an ultra marathon. And then I learned that you know, any time you're running for more than an hour or more, you start to deplete muscle mass and bone, bone density. So it's like, OK. Three years ago, she was one of 200,000 people who expressed interest in a competition to win, if that's the right word, a one-way ticket to Mars. Hi, my name's Di. I'm applying for the Mars One expedition. Now she's one of just 100 worldwide still in the running. If you're having to work as a, an integrated unit who are reliant on each other for survival, your emotional and psychological stability has just got to be that next level. Despite its critics, and there are many, the Dutch company Mars One is pushing on with its mission. Now listed as a public company on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and recently releasing blueprints for a Mars surface spacesuit. To be a publicly listed company, they'll announce a new technology um, report and then there'll be more investment, which will allow them to do more work to do more technology reports, which will see more investment, or the final round of selection, which will see more investment. So it continues to reinforce itself. Mars One is just one of several corporations vying to take the next giant leap forward in space exploration. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. The current frontrunner is SpaceX, led by battery billionaire Elon Musk. The alternative is to become a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species, which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. Since founding the company in this empty office in 2002, SpaceX has defied the doubters time and again. Now it sells its rocket delivery services to, among others, NASA itself. Lift off at the Falcon now. Instead of paying for the entire development and then the entire operations budget of a company, we can now just buy a service for the portion that we need. Costs have been cut enormously. Here, reusable rockets that land themselves on drone platforms floating in the ocean. <laughs> SpaceX plans to send one of these rockets to Mars within two years and humans to the red planet just six years later. A challenge of unimaginable scale, only eclipsed by the dollars needed to succeed. We have to figure out how to improve the cost of trips to Mars by 5 million percent. And for every success along the way, there are many more spectacular failures. Every time people say, well, we're going to be doing it in five or six years, well, they keep saying that for a while until you realise they don't have the technologies in place, they don't have the money in place, they don't have the, the physics in place. How do I protect human beings? How do I feed them? How do I stop them getting Alzheimer's on the way from the radiation damage that you in incur? The answers to such questions could lie in a new era of collaboration. In the past, um, you, you would have like a more of a military-style leadership model, a hierarchy of everything being done. Um, I think the, the role that we're playing now is more like a conductor of an orchestra. Um, everybody plays their parts, 
but and there's a conductor there, uh, but you need the skill sets of every instrument in the in the orchestra. And Diane McGrath believes that's where Mars One comes into the picture, because unlike the others, its astronauts don't plan on coming home. We can already get things to Mars, so the chance of going one way is much more feasible within 10 years. The successful landing of the Mars Curiosity rover was one of humanity's greatest achievements, but it weighs just one tonne. If you want to send humans to Mars, you're looking at about 40 tonnes that you need to land. So there's a, a whole new technology that has to be developed in order to do that. So i got to make water and grow food. The degree of difficulty, where every kilogram matters, could be greatly reduced if the astronauts set up camp on the surface. I am the greatest botanist on this planet. For now, that remains in the realms of Hollywood and docudramas like this one currently airing on National Geographic. I was chosen to command the first human mission to Mars. People tend to have this slight illusion about Mars that because you have robots which are very successfully driving around on the surface and taking pictures of sunsets and there are, there are mountains and hills and dry valleys, that it's a little bit like Arizona or the outback here in Australia. It's not. It's incredibly brutal. Dr Abigail Allwood in Australia for the CI 2016 conference agrees. It doesn't have a magnetosphere, it doesn't have a, you know, an op a, a dynamo that uh, creates that magnetosphere in the, uh, in the centre of the planet doesn't have an atmosphere, doesn't have a hydrosphere. It's completely lacking the fundamental building blocks and to think that we could go there and make that into something habitable when we can't yet manage our own planet is the ultimate hubris. Otherwise it would affect, it would affect the health. Setting up and managing systems just happens to be Diane McGrath's expertise. She's backed by four degrees and has a PhD on the way. What confounds most is why anyone so successful and so engaged with life on Earth would even contemplate a mission where the only certainty is dying, if you're lucky, far, far away. This little guy, he's not able to fit in. I don't think so, though. The answer, the ultimate in public service. I've been fortunate enough over the years to, to work in situations where I've got to do things that have been able to assist society when I was working for the Australian Government, when I worked for the pharmaceutical industry and so forth. So um, this is really just an extension of what I've always kind of done. Mm. Tried to do purposeful things. So it's just at a galactic scale. Few involved in the Mars dream agree on how and when, if ever, humans will set foot there. But there is consensus on one thing, the imperative to try. We're pushing for Mars because we need an inspirational point in the future. Uh, we need a, that hard kind of mountain over the hill. We need that uh, far off land to go explore. We looked at the Apollo landings and we were so thrilled by the idea that human beings could do that, could put the pieces together in those days in a rather primitive way, of course, in retrospect, but actually put human beings on the moon. There needs to be a, a, a long term push to achieve all of the, all of the miracles the engineering science and scientific miracles that need to be uh, achieved before we can safely do it. I find as a species we're quite lazy, but if we're sometimes inspired by something extraordinary, something great, um, then we allow ourselves to be great.